appreciate it. Hey, you know, this morning I am um, part of this U version study, and and you're not going to believe this, but the chapters in the U version study today are Esther one, two, three, four, and I go. I hope it includes five because that'd be really cool. And it does include Esther five, and we're in Esther five today. And I just thought. God, you are alive and well, and you don't have a coincidence, you have a God incident. Do you guys know what a God incident is? That's when God does something, and we just say, oh, it's a coincidence. Oh, goodness sakes, You're, we're ripping God off. Well, let's let's kind of review where we are here, okay? Um, there was this time, let's, let's get that slide up there that's got the, okay? We, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Assyria comes down and they wipe out Jerusalem and they destroy the walls, destroy the temple. And then uh, several years later, Babylonia takes over and they wipe out Assyria and they, 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 they're a new world power. And when they became a new world power, they took the they took the Jews for 70 years, and that's what we call the 70-year exile, if you've never heard of that before, and they're over there for 70 years, and then Persia takes over, and as Persia takes over everything, okay, the king allows the people to return if they want to, and some of them went back to Jerusalem, but some stayed there, one of which was this lady named Queen Esther, okay, and while they're still in Persia there, there's this man named Haman the Agite, okay, and he becomes the prime minister, and, and he actually wants to wipe out all of the Jews. Do you know who else wanted to wipe out all the Jews? King Herod. Do you know who's behind all of this? The devil is, because the devil knows that the Messiah is going to come from the line of the Jews. And if he can wipe out, if he can see that the Jews get wiped out, there's not going to be a Messiah. But poo on that guy. God is just, he's in charge. God is in charge everywhere. And it, it's important to note that it, this isn't the, this is just, it's, it's a behind the scenes thing that some people miss. And quite frankly, the devil hates the Jewish people, and the devil hates what God loves. And when we capture that intensity, we begin to understand that if the Jewish race is eliminated, there would be no Messiah. Hitler tried to wipe out the Jewish people. You know, um, I think the Jews are despised because they are God's chosen people. And if you don't know this, there's jokes around the world that call the Presbyterians God's frozen people, okay? Um, I'm not really sure why, because we have heat in the winter, and we have air conditioning in the summer both, okay? But, but I want you to know that through this, through this time of, uh, of, of Esther chapter 5, the, the character of Esther is revealed. Um, why is that such an important thing? Is because... Character doesn't just automatically happen, okay? She didn't all of a sudden get character. She's had it her whole life, and it just gets revealed. And I think that that's true of a lot of us. We have those moments in life where, where our character gets revealed. We get asked to do something, we say no. Well, that's it, with, with a bad attitude. Sometimes we say yes with a great attitude. Sometimes we step up to the plate. And, and quite frankly, those are times when our character is being revealed. Um, last week, we talked about for such a time as this. And, you know, one of the things that's probably very important to reveal is this, and that is that Jesus Christ is the, simply the greatest example ever of for such a time as this. He, he, uh, he died for yours and my sins. How many guys have a lot of those? Okay. Uh, that, that's why they came up with the adding machines and why they came up with the computers so they could just multiply mine faster, okay? Um, you know, here's a bunch of signs. This is kind of brings us to today. Um, anybody ever had computer problems? Anybody ever had plumbing problems? Anybody ever had health problems? Um, what about financial problems? Anybody ever had financial problems? Okay. Anybody ever had health problems? Anybody ever had family problems? If some of you aren't sitting by your spouse, we'll know that's true today, okay? Anybody else have work problems? Car issues? They're real. Um, 
And, and yet there's this verse in, 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 in Scripture that is revealing of this whole chapter. And it comes from Isaiah 41.10 where it says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You know what? In the most devastating times of life, God is still there. But you know what we have? We have this problem called impatience. And we have this thing called control. And we want what we want when we want it. And quite simply put, we're, at that point in time, we're, we're established ourselves in, in the devil's playing field. Because that's what he wanted. And here's what I want you to know from, from, from this morning. God is worth trusting. As we get started this morning, I want you to know this. God is worth trusting. I knew I'd get at least one later, okay? Um, you know, es Esther is like this. Uh, she's grew up in, she grew up in what we would refer to as a kind of a, kind of a safe area for the most part. I mean, um, she enjoyed relative ease and she'd been living a life of normal challenges of, of growing up. She somehow or other separated from her immediate family. That was common during this time of disruption, okay? Even Jesus got lost once. Jesus didn't go, his parents got lost, okay? Jesus didn't get lost. Um, and, and however things are different now is she's living a life of privileged royalty. But somehow it's clear in her heart about people being responsible for the things that they have been given. In Luke 12, verse 48, it says, to whom much is given, much is required. Um, I don't know if that rings a bell for you or not. But the privileged people of the world have a greater responsibility for the things in the world. Some people say that's not fair. Well, it's not fair that you're privileged either. It's quite frankly, it's not fair that you're privileged either. She's certainly in an important position of comfort at this time of life. But she knows that regardless of her royal position, she's a Jew. And, and one of the great things that that was pointed out to her last week is, is that, hey, if you don't, somebody else will, and your family will be destroyed anyway. How exciting, and yet what a risk. And we learn about courage here. And where does the courage come from? Courage comes from the one that she trusts. Quite frankly, you and I, we don't have enough courage to overcome the world without Jesus Christ. Why do I say that? Because there are challenges that are beyond our wildest imagination. Because the evil one is alive and well and he's strong. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of darkness in the heavenly realms, and against the spiritual forces of evil. How exciting for her and yet what a risk. How exciting to be given the opportunity to stand up in front of everybody and say, King, would you do something about this? What a scary thing. You ever had your heart pumping because you got to go talk to your boss? Okay? You ever had your heart pumping because you had to go talk to the principal? Scary. Responsibility, yet that's something that we learn as a child. You know, um, if you, have a, if you have a, happen to have a chicken coop at your house and you send your child out to get an egg and, and they're careless on the way back and just throw it at the dog, that's irresponsible. And we address that trying to develop responsibility, trying to give them a stronger character. If a child wants a dog and says to feed it, then that child needs to follow through. And you know what? Quite frankly, as a parent, when we say to our child, yeah, are you going to feed it every day? And they say yes. Quite frankly, if they don't, we got to show them. Some people say, no, I'm just going to get rid of the dog. Well, that's actually teaching irresponsibility because that's saying discard what you don't want to deal with. If your teenager's given a job at McDonald's and are responsible for cleaning tables and the garbage, they need to do that. 
And quite frankly, what a great place to learn how to work hard. And what a great place to learn how to work hard where it might be in front of your friends. Because one of our greatest challenges in the world is I don't want to be responsible in front of my friends. I want to be cool. If your son or daughter goes to college, they have a responsibility to study and do the best they can. That might be straight C's. And praise God if they're a C student and they're getting C's. And praise God if they're a B student and they're getting B's. And shame on them if they're getting D's and they're capable of getting A's. The point is this. Each of these people that I've just listed are responsible for the task that they've been entrusted to. Is there a learning curve? Yes. Does this mean that they're a failure while they're learning? No. It means they're learning. In all of these, there's a training of responsibility that's taking place. Why? Because we're trying to put forth character inside of them. And the character that was inside of Esther was the character that was willing to receive these words. But you've been given this opportunity for such a time as this. She was faithful in a little. She's faithful in much. Let's take a look at Esther chapter 5. We're continuing the story here. It says, on the third day, Esther put on her robe, her royal robe, and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he, pleased, he, he was pleased with her and held out his gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Men, don't try that at home. <laughs> don't try that at home. Verse 3. Then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom it will be given to you. In other words, the, all that means is this. You ask for anything you want. Because I'm pleased with you. Verse 4, if it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Food speaks to any man, doesn't it? It doesn't even have to be that great, okay? Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asked. See what I mean? Food, he, he was in a hurry there. He knew there was probably some, some, some good food happening there. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king, the king asked Esther again, Now what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom and it will be granted. Esther replied, My position and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet. I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. In other words, wait. I'm going to get your curiosity up and you're going to give me exactly what I want because God is going to be working in your life for the next 24 hours. Anybody ever asked too soon for something? Huh? When you're a little kid in the store at Christmas time and you ask for every single present in the whole place? She knows what she's doing. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits, but when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Calling together his friends and Teresh, his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways that the king had honored him and how he had elevated him above all the other nobles and officials, meaning he went to, the, he went to dinner with the, with the king and with Esther. And that's not all. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the banquet to, to the king to the banquet she gave. And she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. Isn't it amazing how much favor we find because of who somebody else is? Yeah. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew, Mordecai, sitting at the king's gate. His wife, Teresh, and all his friends said to him, 
have a gallows built 75 feet high and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go with the king to dinner and be happy. This suggestion delighted Haman and he had the gallows built. You know what? There's patience in God's timing. There's great patience with God's timing. She fasted for three days as we learned last week. She prayed. She requested of others to fast. Not, not, not a few, but all of the Jews. She waited to be called by the king. She had two banquets, not one. Quite frankly, she is being patient. You know, the name of God is not mentioned in this book, but fasting, one of the most incredible tools of faith, is mentioned. And it's something that we often don't place as a priority. She, why is fasting such a big deal in God's timing? Because, quite frankly, we're doing something with our mind and our body both and our soul as well. You see, there's something about denying ourselves what we would like for the sake of getting God's attention and letting him know that we are committed to what it is that we're asking for. Esther displays wisdom in her approach to the issue with the king. You know, patience with God's timing is true. College choices, dating and marriage, business decisions, buying a house, having children, applying for jobs. It's true in Proverbs 3, 5 where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. In all your ways acknowledge him. Just not, not the ones just on Sunday, but in all your ways acknowledgement. This means trusting God. This means respecting and honoring God's authority. Because he has perfect timing, he's worth trusting. Because he has perfect timing, he's worth trusting. Would you say that with me? Because of his perfect timing, he's worth trusting. We don't want to jump the gun. Do you know what happens when we jump the gun in races? We're disqualified. Do you know that it used to be that you got two false starts before you got disqualified? 19 years ago, they changed the rule, and you're disqualified on the first one. Why? Because you're breaking the rule. Quite frankly, jumping the gun is not a good thing. God's timing is perfect, and he's worth trusting. God is sovereign, and he's worth trusting. During this time of being patient with God, remember that his wisdom, his power, and his presence has no limits. God has given us access to his scepter. His scepter is given through Jesus Christ. He's our only mediator. What is there that God can't do? What is there that God doesn't know? Where is there that God is not? Absolutely. Nice job, everybody. That means he's worth talking to. That means he's worth trusting as well. He wants to hear from us. He's always on his throne. His ears are always open. And no one intimidates God. Have you ever been intimidated? Oh, my goodness, I've been intimidated. Many times in life. Intimidated when the principal says he wants to see you in his office and it's not to receive a free candy bar. Intimidated when that siren is going on in back of you and that little red thing's going around and you're thinking, what just happened? What did I just do? Now, some, some people have an arrogance at that time, and quite frankly, I get a little nervous about them sometimes because, quite frankly, they're not trusting God. They're trusting their own abilities. You see, Esther was aware of the truth in Proverbs 21.1 where it says this, the king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. He guides wherever he pleases. He is worth trusting. What makes him trustworthy is is that there's nothing he can't do, there's nothing he doesn't know, and there's no place that he is not in existence. Through this passage, we learn this. Our hearts should be prepared. All too often, our enthusiasm and our reactions are the leading element 
This is where being casual gets us into trouble. But Esther has a prepared heart, and this comes because of the fasting that's taking place. Um, I've never fasted for more than 24 hours, but, but I want you to know there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a good friend of this church. And uh, he fasted for 21 days and drank water only. The second time he tried it, he got sick at about the 16th day. And I, and, I, and I said, how you doing? And he said, um, I mean, I didn't know he was fasting. I said, you don't look like you're doing well. And he goes, uh, and he started, this started to happen. And I said, uh, I said, you've been fasting? I said, because you look like you've lost some weight. He goes, yeah. He goes, because this is in God's hand, not mine. And I said, um, what are you going to do for the next five days? And he said, um, I'm going to go home and I'm going to drink and ensure. And I said, those things are those things taste awful, by the way, okay? I, I'd rather fast than have ensure, okay? And he, and he drank and ensure, and it was all he needed for the next five days. I said, how many times have you done this? He goes, I, I, and I don't remember if he said this is the second or this is the third, but I remember him describing the first one to me. And I said, I said what drives you to do that? And he said, because I want to seek the face of God with nothing interrupting my life. You know, really fasting is elevating our view of prayer. It's no little thing. It's not a small habit to be taken lightly. Prayer is not one of those things that um, we should skip doing. Moses was a prayer warrior, Samuel was a prayer warrior, David was a prayer warrior, Paul was a prayer warrior, Jesus was a prayer warrior. They spent hours pleading before God to do great things. I read about men like Martin Luther who actually had a habit of praying praying uh, several times a day at 9, 12, 3, 6, 9, and midnight. And he prayed for approximately an hour each of those times. Our hearts are prepared through prayer Our hearts are prepared through an attitude of humility. And and in Esther's case, it was prepared through the attitude of fasting. Simply saying, I'm denying myself of all human stuff so that I can be focused on what you would have for me, oh God. Do you know another thing we can learn from this passage? You know the enemy hates those who love God? If, if, If you're a believer... Hell lost another one. If you're a believer, the devil doesn't like you, and all he all he knows that he needs to do is distract you. You see, because the worst testimony in the world is one that's distracted. Whenever we're doing the Lord's work, those distractions become high. Issues like these things come up. Why does the enemy hate? God and why does he hate believers because he's prideful and he wants that power for himself he's arrogant and he doesn't want to humble himself before God he's jealous and he wants all the glory for himself and Haman here is the enemy his life is guided by the devil and he failed to trust God Almighty do you know the people around you matter at the end of the story there's this little there's this little thought that Haman went back and talked to his wife and a few other people. He's surrounding himself with people that are encouraging him to hate the Jews. He's surrounding himself with people that are reminding him to think for himself only. Who we are around matters. You know one bad apple spoils the bunch? And then a bunch of bad apples spread around wrecks a bunch of bunches. This is where accountability is so important. This is where transparency is so important. I encourage you more than anything in all the world to say this. Who is somebody that you can be completely honest with? Who's somebody that you can bear things to knowing that they're not ever going to hold it against you, but they're going to lift you up in prayer? Who's somebody that you can go to and simply say, I'm struggling, I need a little support here. Who's somebody you can go to and just say, you know what, I'm I'm struggling with some thoughts. Who's somebody you can go to and simply say, hey, 
Um, I need some encouragement right now. We all have a need for that. And quite frankly, most of us just kind of avoid that. Sorry, there's a little hair in my mouth. I apologize. What are our closest friends pointing us to? Are they pointing us to sin and recklessness towards the kingdom of God, towards selfishness and toward glorifying themselves rather than God, toward greed and the generosity of ministry to ourselves? Or are they pointing us towards the kingdom of God? Are they pointing us towards glorifying God? Are they, are they pointing us towards advancing ministry? You see, our great relationship with our spouse and with our family should never be towards aimless wandering and careless responsibility. If you care enough about the things of God to get involved with his people and point them towards faithfulness, I ask that you would find somebody that you would trust and that would there we go, I finally got it. That you would find some, that you, as you find somebody, that, that you would get into a life of encouragement with them. Um, here's the last thing. Um, if you put all this together, you know what you and I need to do? We need to get a new scorecard. You know, in, 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 in golf, they have these things called scorecards. And and the truth is, is that you're supposed to write on the card what you scored, not what you hoped to score. Okay? And, and, as, you, as, and as you write down what you score, maybe you should put a smiley face under that sometime. And maybe you should put a thumbs down sometime. Or maybe you should put something that says, man, as I watched my ball go into that water, there was a big fish there. We need new scorecards. This is a true story, okay? I'll play golf with anybody, but don't tell me how to play. Because this is my goal. If it's a par five, that means that's the designated score you're trying to get. My goal is to get on in four and have one opportunity to make par. I'm not a very good golf, but that's my goal. Once I'm in back of a tree... I'm having a whole lot more fun kicking it out into the fairway so I can keep playing and be happy rather than try to get it around that tree because that's not going to be any fun. That is ruining my experience. See, my scorecard is I'm looking for one par the entire day. If you're not a good golfer, that's a good place to say amen. Why? Because, because I decided a long time ago I'm not good enough I, I don't have the skills with my hands. They're a little bit shaky at times. And, and quite frankly, I'm going to have a whole lot more fun if I change the scorecard. And you and I in life, we've been taught this. That the most important thing in a church is how many people are there. The most important thing in a church is how many buildings that, that church owns. The most important thing in a church is, is, is how much money is given. We must change the scorecard in our churches for success from great services and extra large gatherings to a deep transformation of discipleship over every person's life in our church. It is God's time for the church to redo her scorecard for success. Let me give you some examples. Have you trusted God more this last week than you ever have in your life? Then by golly, you got a par. You got a birdie. Are you trusting God and his promises more than ever before? Then give yourself a birdie. Are you giving more financially in faith to be used for missions and for God's work around the world? Then praise God. That's a wonderful scorecard. Are you giving more financially with your time as well than you previously ever did for the work of evangelism? Then praise God. You got a birdie. Are you encouraging and sharing about trusting God with other people? Not just in your family, but, but, but with other people as well. Then give yourself a birdie. Are you sharing and hearing more about changed lives? Are you sharing and hearing more about the work of God? Are you sharing and hearing more about lives being molded into Christ's likeness? Are you practicing spending an obedient life in the way you live? Are you spending more time with the Savior than ever before? Then give yourself a birdie. 
Because God's timing says it might take a little while for that character to get developed. It might take a little while for there to be a transformation in your life. You know, God takes the impossible and he turns them around. That's really what happens in it. There was a sailor who had a wreck at sea. It was a devastating situation. He ended out on a, um, on a deserted island. As far as he knew, he didn't know if it ever had had people. And he found a way to take care of himself. You see, he was the only survivor from that ship. This is a true story, by the way, okay? And, uh, and he built for himself a little hut right next to the, right next to the water. And he found a certain level of joy in going to find fish to eat, going to find fish to catch, trying to catch some birds. And one day while he was out, he had actually created a little fire inside of his hut. And while he was out looking for, looking for some things to eat that he would catch, he came back and his hut was on fire. And his whole life flashed before his eyes and he said, how could something so devastating happen to me? And in his frustration, he was crying and he ended up falling asleep. About five hours later, a ship came. And he, <laughs> he says, to the, says to the captain of the ship, he says, how'd you guys end out? He goes, well, we saw this fire and the smoke and we knew there had to be somebody there. God takes those things that are falling apart, those things that are alive, and he's there. Can I remind you of something? You ever had car issues? Maybe it's time to look to God. You ever had burnt popcorn problems? <laughs> hey, maybe it's time to look to God. You ever had broken bones? Maybe it's time to look to God. You ever had dirty clothes? Maybe it's time to look to God. You ever, you, ever, you, ever, you ever had these kind of challenges? You ever had problems with health? Then turn to God. You ever had plumbing problems in your house? Then turn to God. You ever had computer challenges? Then turn to God. You ever, you ever had work problems? Guess what? Say it with me. Turn to God. You ever had family issues? Then what? Turn to God. You ever had health problems? Let's turn to God. You ever had financial problems? Then turn to God. Not your credit card. I want you to know that maybe you've arrived here today and you've thought to yourself, I have problems and I need to turn to God. Maybe you're thinking, ah, life, is, life is stinky. And I need something from God that I haven't had before. I need to trust him like Esther trusted him. I need to realize that he loves me and he died on the cross for me. And as we sing this last song, as Tim, Tom and the, and, the, and the praise band comes, as we, as we sing this last song, I want to encourage you to just say this to yourself. Maybe you haven't been trusting God the way you should. Maybe you've never trusted God. If you've never trusted God, I invite you during this song to just Walk up here and say, Pastor John, I want to trust God today. I want to trust God today for the very first time. Maybe you're thinking, I haven't been trusting God the way I should, and maybe you just want to come and kneel up here and say, Dear God, I want to trust you more than ever before and just spend a little time with God during the song. Because really, this morning is about us learning to trust him more than ever before. Would you stand and would you ask God, Dear God, have I been trusting you? Have I been trusting you?